So I'm waiting for the announcement of the 2010 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. The physics prize yesterday was for graphene, almost chemistry. So it'd be interesting to see what happens today. Whose names will be revealed? We're literally moments away from finding out. People talk about who might win the prize, but really very few people have any idea because they don't know the criteria that are chosen to judge these things. So usually, or quite often, it comes as a surprise. But then you think, gosh, that was a good idea to reward that. So let's see if we'll be surprised today. These are prizes for reactions for making carbon-carbon bonds in organic molecules. Very famous reactions. Heck reaction catalyzed by palladium and the Suzuki reaction, which is also quite similar. Right, so it's a very exciting day for organic chemists. Um, three Nobel Prizes in chemistry this year. Uh, all going to palladium catalyzed cross coupling reactions. Well, it pioneered, I guess, it's a, a new reaction of its kind that allows carbon carbon bond formation. So imagine these two are carbons. It allows them to stick them together, which is an unnatural process. Over the past few years, the Chemistry Prize has gone to really good pieces of science, but often it's been a bit of science that isn't easily identifiable with mainstream chemistry. This prize this year is really associated with organic chemistry, the things that thousands, perhaps millions of chemists do every day, making organic molecules. So I think it will really resonate. Do you use it a lot? Oh yeah, we use it regular. I mean, in fact, we, we're doing one today in the lab, so um, I'm, I'll just show you what we're actually doing So to explain it. We're making a natural product, and this, this is the structure of the natural product, and we're trying to make this bond between these two carbon atoms here. The prize has been won by three chemists, two in the United States, one in Japan, Heck and Nagishi in United States, and Suzuki in Japan. And all of them have a reaction named after them. So if we go backwards and split this in half, we get to two fragments. And these fragments are what the Suzuki reaction uses. We use this boronic acid and this what we call a vinyl bromide. And using a palladium catalyst, the palladium zero, it allows us to stitch these two carbons together using a really neat catalytic cycle. When you find a really good reaction, you often get it named after you. The Heck reaction, Suzuki reaction, Nagishi. And all of these reactions are designed for making carbon-carbon bonds, joining two molecules, each that contain carbon, with a single bond between two carbon atoms. You can imagine that this is really good because it allows you to take small building blocks and build up large molecules, like the molecules that you find in natural products that are made by strange organisms. The common link between all three prize winners is their reactions involve palladium. Palladium, in case you've forgotten, is number 46 here on the periodic table. It's the element immediately above platinum. And the idea is that you take some sort of compound, for example, in the case of the Heck reaction, it's a benzene ring. And we've got a halogen. So this green one here uh, is a halogen. It could be a bromine or an iodine or a chlorine. And it has a bromine attached to it. And what they found was that palladium was able to, to snip this bond off and then attach that uh, bond to a carbon. So the palladium atom goes between the carbon of the benzene ring and the bromine. So you can make a carbon-carbon bond. So here is the Richard Heck reaction. These aren't really quite to scale, but you get the idea. A carbon-carbon compound, for example, ethene, ethylene, with just a double bond between the two carbons, comes in and attaches to the palladium. It's making a carbon-carbon bond. So this two-carbon unit bonds onto the benzene. And the bromine and the palladium go away into the solution. And the two other reactions, the Suzuki 
and the um, Nagishi work on the same principle, but instead of bromine, Nagishi uses zinc and Suzuki uses boron or boron oxygen compound. Now, why is that important? Well, all of the pharmaceutical ingredients around the world, um, active pharmaceuticals, uh, they have carbon-carbon bonds, and there we've just made one in a really simple fashion. And not only that, uh, but it's controlled. We know exactly where this bond is going to be made. It's going to be made where that halogen atom was previously. And that, for the pharmaceutical industry, really revolutionised the way that they could make molecules. They could plan and put anything wherever they wanted around this ring. The important thing is, with a small amount of palladium, you can make a lot of material. Well, this is a palladium catalyst which is used quite a lot. It's called palladium tetricus or palladium triphenylphosphine uh, tetricus. So it's got palladium with four triphenylphosphine groups around it. And it's a nice material. It's, it's quite, normally quite bright yellow. But let's have a look what this is like. This is, okay, it's not too bad. It's gone off a little bit. So it's going a little bit orange. That means we need to purify it before we use it. Right, so here we have the magic powder, or one of the magic powders. This is palladium acetate. I'll just tip a little out because it's quite difficult to see in there. So you see, you'll see it's a, just a very benign looking brown powder. So quite sad in amongst all this is that there would have been a fourth contributor to this, uh, a guy called John Stilly. Tragically, he, he was uh, killed. He was right in there at the start. And he found uh, that actually tin carbon bonds could also be broken by palladium. The Nobel Prize can't be awarded posthumously uh, to uh, people who have sadly passed away. So had he lived, uh, I think it was a plane crash uh, that tragically took him away, um, that he would have been the fourth person. It's important to remember that. We're going to head off to my lab and uh, Dr. Plavi Sharma is going to show you a Suzuki coupling. Yeah. I've been fortunate enough to meet Professor Nagishi when I was a student at Purdue University. I spent a year as an undergraduate there and uh, I interacted with him a couple of times and he's a great guy and very inspirational. And we're in my lab, this is Dr. Plavi Sharma. Say hi Plavi. Hi. Uh, Plavi's doing a Suzuki reaction today. Uh, she does quite a few of them. So what she's doing now, she's taking her apparatus and you see a big balloon on top of it. Well that's full or filled with argon, which is an inert gas, it means it doesn't react with much of things. She's filling up the syringe with some THF, which is dried, so we've got a still here, which the THF's in the bottom is sodium wire, and it distills up, and it's nice and dry in here. Uh, she's injecting that into the flask through this rubber septum, and that allows the uh, solution to go in without having contamination from the outside atmosphere, so this is all under nitrogen or argon still. It's great. Now, she's going to take a measured volume of our substrate, so now, Plavi's adding the reagents or the, the building blocks in there. So in that flask now, we've got some THF, the two blocks that we're going to stick together, and nothing's going to happen yet until we add the catalyst. So this is the palladium catalyst that I showed you earlier on, and now Plavi's going to add it. There's quite a bit there. She's going to add it, and all of a sudden, now the chemistry can start happening. Sometimes you need to heat the reaction, but in this case, we've done it several times. We're reproducing it. It works very well. So. Um, yeah, we're just going to leave it for a couple of hours now, come back, and hopefully our building blocks would have been stuck together and we've got our compound. That's a Suzuki reaction.